We thank you for another opportunity, Father God, to come to your house of prayer. Lord, we honor you today for you are worthy. You are worthy of all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. We come tonight, tonight, Father God, as you did it with us. We pray, Father God, that you would lead us, guide us, direct us, and protect us. Bless us on tonight, Father God, that we will plan your will, plan your way, and operate in your world. So much so, Father God, that you will get the glory. All the honor and all the praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Thank you all for joining us here tonight. Uh, we are here for our Bible study and vision meeting. You should have picked up uh, three sheets of paper on your way in, two halves and one whole. Uh, we are going to plan tonight for the, the year of 2023. Amen? Amen? So there are four things that I want to talk about as we get started toward 2023. If the Lord spares us, hallelujah. If God spares us, you should look at your, your paper that says ministry focus for 2023. Ministry focus for 2023 is where we are on tonight. We want to make sure that we allow God to lead us. The first thing we're going to do is focus on prayer. Our focus will be on prayer. We'll be on communicating with God, talking to God, making sure that God is hearing from us and making sure we hear from God. Our first focus will be prayer. Our second focus will be evangelism and we believe that evangelism and prayer are two of the most neglected entities of the local church. So we will focus much on evangelism, uh, even more than ever before, reaching souls for Jesus Christ. We always have a goal. This year's goal for evangelizing is uh, 50 souls coming to Christ by way of baptism, salvation, and church attendance. So evangelism, we will focus on those three things, bringing souls to Christ, 50 souls to Christ, by way of salvation, baptism, and church attendance. The third thing we will focus on is discipleship. Discipleship. Meaning building those up. Meaning making sure that after men, women, boys, and girls have come to Christ, we want to make sure they live a Christ-like life. And they can do that with mentorship. Discipleship is what it's called. And Jesus speaks much of discipleship, us showing others the way to go as far as Jesus is concerned. And the fourth thing we want to do is service. We want to serve. We come in here on Sunday to be built up, to be empowered. We come in on Wednesday night to be built up and empowered. And so we leave for service. We come for worship and then we leave for service. And we, we are to serve around the building. We serve each other and serve other people. Uh, service is much tied into mission. So our call to mission is to serve. The difference between evangelism and mission, evangelism is reaching souls of Christ to unsaved. Whereas uh, discipleship is to reach those who are saved but help them be led in the proper direction 
And then when you get to service, which is mission, uh, it is to help those who are less fortunate than we are uh, through service, through service. Amen? So if you would look at your paper, we will go over 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18. It says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. This is the will of God. He says, Rejoice in everything, rejoice always, rejoice anyhow, rejoice in the midst of what's going on around you. He says, Rejoice. Paul says to the church at Thessalonica, Rejoice. The church at Thessalonica, Rejoice, rejoice. He says, get happy. He says, rejoice. He, sa he says, have joy over and over and over again. Have joy over and over and over again. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. He says, pray without ceasing. How long is praying without ceasing? Praying continually. Praying without stopping. Talking to God without stopping. Is he talking about Spend 24 hours a day praying. He says pray without ceasing. What is he talking about? Spend 24 hours without, without praying. He says if you want. If you have the opportunity. If you have the opportunity, that, 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 that sounds like church talk. That, that sounds like y'all convicted to uh, to say, say church stuff. So can you really pray without ceasing? Can you actually pray without ceasing? Let me ask the question this way. Can you pray without stopping? I pray without Some people wait till they get to church before they pray without stopping. They don't want to stop at all once they get to church. I don't know if they're trying to prove something to somebody. I don't know if they're trying to get some better boys. I don't know if they're trying to make sure that people know they're spiritual. But he's not talking about praying like that. He's not talking about praying 24 hours a day nonstop because you never get anything are done and you never meet and greet new people. So evangelism goes out the window if you pray all 24 hours a day. But what he is saying is you ought to have a praying heart. Yes, ma'am. No, I was just going to say, the people of God can say that in a different way. He doesn't mean just keep praying, praying, <coughs> praying, and praying one minute after another. But pray, like you said, have a prayer life. And right. you pray toward uh, Lord, not only when you're in trouble, but just pray. Right. Just so he said, it. pray continuously. Pray. Don't wait. She said, wait. Don't wait till you get in trouble to pray. Many people use prayer as a fire escape. Do you know in high rise build, buildings, when a fire break out, you cannot use the elevator. And then if you cannot get to the stairway, they have a ladder that you throw off the side. It's called a fire escape. Sometimes people pray in the form of a fire escape. I'm in trouble now, Lord, I need your help. And they do like some people, children do. They don't hear from them until they need some. And God doesn't hear from many people until, he, until they're in trouble or they need something. So he says, whatever you do, pray without ceasing. Mean that you ought to have a spirit of prayer. You ought to have a heart of prayer. You ought to be talking to God on the way. You ought to talk to him. You ought to let him know what, what you think about him. You ought to begin by honoring him and glorifying him. And then give thanks in all things. Be thankful in everything. Be thankful in the good and the bad. Be thankful. Can you find one good thing in the midst of when you're going through something? Can you find one good thing that you can say, Lord, I thank you. In the midst of the trouble, in the midst of the sickness, in the midst of the hard times, you got to get to a point in your life where you say, Lord, I thank you. Early in the morning, you ought to get up and say, thank you, Lord. Late at night, you ought to get up and say, thank you, Lord. And if you're like me, when you want to move one way, you have to thank him to make sure you appreciate just being able to move. Are you with me? So he says, in everything give thanks, in all things give thanks. For this is the will of the Lord in Christ Jesus for you. You need to make sure that you're in Christ's will, first of all, by rejoicing in all things, rejoicing always. Then secondly, by praying without ceasing. 
Thirdly, giving thanks in all things, and then know that you in God's will. Hebrew 4, 4 and 16 says this. Let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find help in time of need. Now he's saying, in time of need, you need mercy. You need grace on the throne of grace. But not only that, don't wait until you need that mercy and you think you need that mercy because you always need that mercy. You always, how many people need mercy every day? Or sometime a day? How many people really need God to have mercy? My, my, one of my, one of my early uh, babysitters, Mary Lee Clark, used to tell us before we go to bed, uh, when you pray, you ought to say, Lord, have mercy. Because you messed up somewhere during the day. And you're asking God, don't have, hold that mistake against you. So you ought, to, you ought to come before the throne of grace. And how can we, why can we now go boldly before the throne? How can we go boldly? Why is it possible for us to go boldly before the throne? Yes, ma'am. Oh, because uh, when Christ died on the cross, the veil was ripped. Right, so Christ died on the cross, the veil was torn. What veil? That petition that separated us from God. Christ allowed us, and he allows us now to go boldly. This word boldly means with confidence. We can go boldly before the throne of grace. We can go before God with confidence. And the confidence is he hears us. And because he hears us, he can and he will answer us. How I many of you want him to answer you right now? Right now, Lord. Lord, in the name of Jesus, right now. Anybody? Nobody. The reason why I'm calling you right now, I want you to answer me right now. Matter of fact, God, I've been calling you all week long. Now, Lord, I need you to answer me right now. It'd be nice if God just listen now and do it now. It'll be good while we need, while we know we need you. But you know, God knows what we really need, and He knows what we need even before we know what we need. And even when we think we need some, guess what? God knows what we don't need. And the thing about Him, we can come to Him. It says, "By the throne of grace, to the throne of grace." We can come to Him and we ask Him, but we can't get our needs met our way. See, huh? I won't tell God how to bless me. I want to tell him what to bless me with. I want to tell him when to bless me. And that's all of us, right? We want it the way we want it. We want it when we want it. We want it uh, right now. And when we want it is always right now. And uh, those who uh, are false prognosticators, they'll tell you, just pray and he's going to bless you right now. But most of us know that that God many times don't operate that way. But he has, he has mercy for us and we can find grace as we need. Matthew chapter 9, 37 through 38 says, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. He said, Souls out there are plenteous. There are a whole heap of souls out there that have not met Jesus Christ. That's why, that's why we can't, we cannot, we cannot, as, as members of church, go in and convince other people to leave their church and join our church. That's called, that's called proselyting. When we just swap members, when we just exchange locations. When we just stop going to this congregation, go to that congregation. And when we convince them, it's called proselyting. That's known as swelling, not growing. We want to grow the church with unbelievers and non-believers and the unchurched the unsaved. We ought to be willing to grow our church because the harvest is plenteous. There are a bunch of unsaved folk out there. There are a bunch of unchurched people out there. They go to church nowhere. We don't have to steal members and say, hey, y'all come over here. You don't have to talk bad about their church to convince them to come to New Beginning Church. You don't have to talk bad about their pastor, even when you know something bad about it. 
You don't have to tell people bad things about them to get them which is when your motive is to draw them to, to your church. Jesus says, the Bible says, Matthew says, the harvest is plenteous. But what he does say is pray the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into the harvest. In other words, you want people to come and join you. We ought to be praying for folks to come join us. Lord, grow our church. Lord, grow the ministry. Lord, grow the, those souls that will reach other souls. We ought to be praying that. And we ought to be praying that without ceasing. We praying for stuff, but we ought to be praying for souls. We ought to be praying for disciples. So Matthew 9, 37 and 38 says, we ought to pray without ceasing. We ought to pray without ceasing for the harvest. Evangelism and discipleship. Matthew 28, 19 through 20 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Go ye therefore and make disciples. Not only should we reach them through the salvation story, we ought to help to develop them. The problem with the local church, we expect the fish to come up the sidewalk. If I came to your house, <laughs> if I came to your house and you told me, show up at 3 o'clock in the morning, we're going to go fishing. And you stood on the sidewalk and we both have poles. Standing on the sidewalk, standing on your driveway, we both have poles. And because it has rained, we got our pole out there in the water in front of your house. There's no lake in front of your house. We got it in the street. And we call in the fish in. You would really think I lost it, wouldn't you? Because the fact of the matter is, fish don't come up the sidewalk. We see people at least once a month that walk in our church. And they're looking for the church down the street. And then they turn around and they walk out. See, fish that come up the sidewalk, they don't stay. And the only reason they stop by is because when they put New Home Church in Google Maps, it points them to New Beginning Church. And, and whenever I'm up preaching, I can tell when a person uh, looking for the church down the street. Because they come in and they start looking around. And they don't see Pastor Blake anywhere. And many times I'm already up preaching and, and they say, that ain't Pastor Blake, he got some hell on his head. So they're looking for the new home church down the street. So we can't depend on fish to walk up the sidewalk. We got to go, go get them. And once we get them, we have to help to develop them. That's why it's dangerous for people to be in church and not be in the teaching arm. It's dangerous to not go to Sunday school. It's dangerous to not go to Bible study. It's dangerous to not go to seminars. It's dangerous to not go to conferences. That's why we develop them. It says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Once they have been caught, then you clean them, and you are to develop them, and then you are to baptize them. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. Amen. Daddy had a problem with flying. You couldn't get him in an airplane, couldn't get him in a helicopter. And this is one scripture he remembers well. He said, the Lord said he will be with you low. So he didn't fly because that's high. So daddy would tell you in a minute, the Lord said, lo, I will be with you. He didn't say how I will be with you. He says lo. But lo, when he talks about lo here, he's saying, behold, he's saying, he says, certainly, I will be with you always. He says, all these things I have commanded you, lo, I will be with you always. Matthew 22, 36 through 40, we're still talking about discipleship and evangelism. We got to evangelize them. If we're going to be successful in ministry this year and next year, we're going to have to do it through evangelism and discipleship. Matthew 22, 36 through 40, Jesus says to them, 
You shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. You ought to have love for the Lord. You ought to love the Lord. If you don't love anybody else, you need to love the Lord. And you need to love him in such a way that your heart loves him. You love him with your soul. You love him with all your mind. You need to really, really, really check yourself to make sure you love the Lord. Then he says, this is the first commandment. And the second is like the first. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. These two commandments hang all. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. In other words, these two commandments lay it all out for us. You ought to love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with everything you get, you ought to love the Lord. Everything you have, you ought to love the Lord. And then you ought to love your neighbor. Who is your neighbor? Is it just the person next door? Brother said today on the news, he said, there is only one race, the human race. So we ought to love the human race. We ought to love everybody. And he says here in Matthew 22, 36 through 40, he says that we ought to love them the way we love the Lord. Isn't that so? We ought to love them the way we love the Lord. So we are to evangelize. Go get them this year as well as next year. We want to be adamant. We want to be extreme. We want to, to go and seek out souls for the kingdom. We want to love people to Christ. You got to love them to Christ. They have to see your love. Jesus says, they will know that you are my disciples by your love. First of all, your love for one another. And then the love you have for other people. <clears throat> Service. Service. Matthew 25, 20 through 21. Service, I told you that service is mission. Service is mission. You're doing your missionary work. You, everybody ought to be on a mission. You ought to be on a mission to reach souls for Christ. Then you ought to be on a, a mission to help disciple somebody. You ought to have two, three, four, five people that you're discipling. And then the, you ought to be on a mission to serve people. To serve people. To serve people. And when we are on a mission to serve people, we get to a point in our lives where we serve people and as we serve them, as we serve those people, as we serve those people, then God gets the glory. It's not for you to glorify yourself. It's not for you to glorify yourself. It's for God to get the glory. When you serve. That's why, that's why you shouldn't let the right hand know what the left hand doing. What does that mean? Don't let the right hand know what the left hand doing. What does that mean? Don't tell everything you know. Don't tell everything you know. What is it pertaining to? Don't tell everything you know. What does that mean? You're doing your service without bragging about it or promoting it. Right. So don't don't promote yourself. Don't be your own agent. There are some people that's their own agent. They, they promote themselves. They can't promote church. They can't promote preaching. They can't promote the pastor. They can't promote, they can't promote Jesus, but they can promote themselves. There are some people in church that can tell you everything they did. And they want to make sure you know everything they did. And if you don't know, if you didn't hear them the first time, they're going to tell you three times over. Four times over. So he says, whatever you do, don't let the right hand know what the left hand does. In other words, do your service. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 20 through 21, we find the guy with the five talents. Talks, Matthew talks about the fact that there were three guys that were given talents. And there was one given the most talents. And he was the guy that was given five. Verse 20 picks up this thought and says, So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents. In other words, he brought ten. He was given five, he brought ten. What are you doing with your talent? 
He says he, he brought five more talents or five other talents saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside them. In other words, he shows back up with ten talents. And when he showed back up with ten talents, look what happens. His Lord said to him, now realize now this is this is like a, a human master. That's why Lord is in a lowercase letter. He, his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter or come into, enter into the joy of your Lord. Are you faithful with what God's given you? Or are you just sitting on it? Or are you just making excuses for things? Are you faithful? Are you serving anybody, serving anything? Are you making a difference? The good thing about some people who retire, they retire, and before they retire, the boss and the co-workers begged them to stay and said, no, I'm going to retire and I'm going to, well, what you going to do? I'm going to work for my church. I'm going to work for the Lord. I'm going to show up and work for the Lord. I came to Houston with no family, got laid off after a year and a half, and I decided that I'm going to hang around the church, I'm going to work for the church. I learned the whole operations of church. I was, I was at the church, that was my second home. I was retired for a moment. I, was, I, I had not resigned, but I was retired. And during that period, I learned how to usher. That's why the ushers can't pull anything over on me. I learned how to sing in the choir, they accepted me singing. I, I learned how to pray. I learned how to be a deacon. I knew how to serve. I knew how to lead missions. I learned how to teach because I spent my time saturating myself with the word of God. Hanging out with people who were in the word. You ought to saturate yourself. Find yourself something to do to serve the Lord and to serve people. Finally, in Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 through 24. It says, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Remember to do it with all you got. Put your heart into it. Do it with everything you have. Put everything you have into it. Do it with excitement. Do it with enthusiasm. Get into it. Don't have to do it. Don't do it sometime, then don't do it other time. Get into it. Give, it. give it your all. Because the service, the mission that you do is unto the Lord. Because guess what? People may not give you credit, but the Lord will. People may not notice it, but the Lord notices it. He says, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily unto the Lord. Do it as unto the Lord. Do it to the Lord himself and not unto me. And don't do it to impress folks. A lot of people do things just to impress people. Just to make sure that people know they did it. They do it to impress. To impress people. He says, do it heartily. Do it to the Lord. Or unto the Lord. Or not unto men. Do it to the Lord. Knowing that the Lord, that from, knowing, knowing that from the Lord, you will receive the reward of the inheritance. Knowing that the Lord will give you your inheritance. Knowing that the Lord will reward you. We wait on folk to reward us. We want to, and then, you know, I, I don't see it yet. I don't understand it yet. Somebody can pray and they'll ask the person, how did I pray? Somebody to do work and do a song. How did I sound? How did I do? Did you do it for them? Or did you do it for him? That's why when I start singing, Sister Henry, when I start singing, guess what? I'm singing unto the Lord. And guess what? I'm giving back to the Lord what the Lord has given me. And guess what? I'm not singing to you anyway. <laughs> Say amen, Sister Henry. That's a fake amen now, y'all. That's a phony amen. I'm not, I'm not singing unto you. I'm singing unto the Lord. 
And the Lord can't expect me to hit a baritone or, or hit a soprano or an alto when he made me a tenor. I have to give back to the Lord what the Lord has given me. Because when you sing for people, one day they'll say you sound good. The next day they'll say you feel flat on your face. So when you do things, do it unto the Lord, not of men. And then understand that your reward comes from the Lord. Your reward comes from the Lord. God has the reward. God has your reward. Who has your reward? God has it. Who's going to give you your reward? God will. So he says, knowing that the Lord himself will give you your inheritance, your reward, your reward will come from him. For you serve the Lord Christ Jesus. You serve the Lord Christ Jesus. For those of you who are listening to us, we have presented to you our mission for and our vision for 2021. 2023, I'm sorry, 2023. And the final verse says, whatever you do, do it unto the Lord. And the only way you can do it unto the Lord, only way you can celebrate him is to be born again. You got to be born again. You must believe this story. He says that you, you serve for you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason why we serve the Lord Jesus Christ is because he's the one that died for us over 2,000 years ago. And because he has died for us, we ought to give service unto him. And as we give service unto him, as we uh, make sure that we develop evangelism unto him and discipleship unto him, and as we pray, we pray unto him, we target him, we understand really, really well it's because Jesus died on the cross for us. He died, he was buried, he rose, and he was seen. Those of you who are present that have not received Jesus Christ, this is a good moment to receive him. Just believe that he died for your sins. He was buried in a barred tomb. He rose from the dead. Invite him into your life, and he can make you a new person. Will you join me now and invite Christ into your life? Just repeat this simple prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. We believe that you're born again. We believe that you need to be connected to a good Bible teaching church. I recommend the New Beginning Church. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for being with us. We look forward to hearing from you. Let us know if you receive Jesus Christ. If you want to give to this ministry, it's a good ministry to give to. If you want to give, you can do so by Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. And our, you can mail in your gift. Our P.O. Box is P.O. Box 503. Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Again, thank you so much for blessing us with your presence. Thank you for joining us. God bless you and God keep you.